Hey everybody, one quick note before we get started today, uh, a bunch of people had asked in the comments of some of my other videos if they could somehow support what I'm doing here. So in the description, there is a PayPal link if you are so inclined, and there's also an Amazon wish list for various books that are related to evolution and creationism. This is something I'm doing as a hobby. Please, nobody should feel obligated to contribute anything, but since a couple people have asked, I did put those things together. So if you feel so inclined, Thank you, I greatly appreciate it. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to Creation Myths, everybody. Today, we are going to tackle the creation myth that evolutionary biology and evolutionary biologists make no testable predictions, which is kind of weird speaking personally because in my career as an evolutionary biologist, I have made and tested a number of specific predictions. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of today's myth, we need to talk a little bit about how science works. So let's look at the scientific method and specifically hypothesis testing. A hypothesis is nothing more than a proposed explanation for some observed phenomenon. So when you are going to test a hypothesis, first you have to propose a hypothesis. You say, I think this explains whatever I'm observing. Once you have proposed your hypothesis, you can derive predictions from that hypothesis. Basically, you can say, if my hypothesis is correct, then I predict whatever. And then that's when you get into the fun part of hypothesis testing via observation or experiment. So you test your predictions in order to evaluate your hypothesis. The way this works is that the prediction that you make must logically flow from the hypothesis. And we've all heard, if you think back to high school science, you remember if-then statements? We were probably told that the if-then statement was your hypothesis, but more technically speaking, the if-then is your prediction. So what you're saying when you make a prediction is if hypothesis, if my hypothesis is true, then X, Y, and Z must be the case and we can then test whether X, Y, and Z is actually the case. So for example, if relativity is accurate and gravity bends light, then we could observe light bending around the sun. And that was a very famous experimental test of the theory of relativity. Another example is if the lac operon is required for lactose metabolism, then cells without the lac operon cannot grow on lactose alone. So these are just very basic examples of how you would test a hypothesis making specific predictions. If hypothesis, then specific prediction. That's the idea. Now, creationists like to claim that creationism leads to testable predictions, and Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who wrote Replacing Darwin, is kind of the poster child for this argument, and he goes so far down this rabbit hole that he basically touts making the predictions as ends unto themselves, right? Well, I'm making testable predictions, as though you don't then have to actually test them and verify that they're correct. But while creationists will claim creationism leads to testable predictions, they'll say that evolution does not. So let's examine that claim. Does evolution actually lead to testable predictions? Surprise, surprise, it leads to a lot of testable predictions. I'm not going to go through anywhere near an exhaustive list right now. I'm just going to give you some of the ones that I like. So we're going to look at three specific examples, one of which you may very well have heard of, but the other two I hope are a little bit new to viewers. Our first evolutionary prediction is going to be about one of the most famous fossil finds in history, and this is, of course, Tiktaalik the organism that represents an intermediate state between fully marine fish and terrestrial tetrapods, organisms that walk on land with four legs. This discovery was specifically predicted by evolutionary theory. So for not just for Tiktaalik, but for the other two as well, we're going to go through what the hypothesis is and then what the specific predictions were, and then we'll see how those predictions were verified. Before I go any further talking about Tiktaalik, I just want to plug the book Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin, which talks about this discovery and a bunch of other aspects of evolutionary biology. It's a fantastic book. I can't recommend it highly enough. That's Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin. So now let's talk about the hypothesis that led to the discovery of Tiktaalik. The hypothesis in this case was that terrestrial vertebrates evolved from marine vertebrates. Nothing groundbreaking there. That is a necessary consequence of life originating in the oceans and universal common ancestry. So we know that terrestrial vertebrates have to come from things in the oceans. But from this hypothesis, we can generate some specific predictions. For example, we expect to find an organism with a mix of marine and terrestrial traits. Such an organism had to have existed at some point in the past. 
And second, that specific organism would have lived in a coastal region approximately 350 to 400 million years ago, give or take. Now, based on those predictions, we can then go out and look and see if we can find such an organism. These predictions were confirmed in 2004 with the discovery of Tiktaalik, which was found in 375 million year old coastal sediments in far northern Canada. The cool thing about this fossil is that, as expected, it exhibits a mixture of marine and terrestrial features. So you can see here, it has scales, it has fins, and you can't see in the fossil, but it had both gills and lungs like many fish do. But it also has a neck, which fish do not have. It has eyes on the top of its flat skull. And if you look at its limbs, it resembles a tetrapod limb in terms of the bone structure. So this fossil uh, is the remains or shows the, the morphology of an organism that has an intermediate state between a fully marine and a fully terrestrial morphology. Prediction confirmed. The second set of predictions that I'll talk about concern human origins. Now, humans, at which, by which I mean Homo sapiens, uh, originated in East Central Africa between two and 300,000 years ago. That's KYA is 1,000 years ago. And from this, we can make a lot of predictions. Now, the thing I'll say here is that the original site and timing of human origins was determined using fossil evidence. We can then use that fossil evidence, once we get really good at genomics, to make a bunch of predictions about human genetics and the relationships among different human lineages. So here's our hypothesis. Humans originated in Africa. From that, we can make a number of specific predictions. For example, extant human populations will have higher genetic diversity within Africa than outside of Africa. We also expect to see non-African human genetic diversity as a subset of within Africa diversity. In other words, we expect to see non-African diversity nested within the overall human clade, which has a common ancestor that existed somewhere in Africa. And finally, we expect to see less diversity in populations that are further from Africa along human migratory routes. So we expect to see the most diversity in Africa, and then the next highest level of diversity in the areas immediately surrounding Africa. And then as you get into, for example, uh, East Asia, Oceania, and the Americas, you expect to see less and less diversity. So how do these predictions check out against the genomic data that we now have? Well, they've all been confirmed. Here's a figure from a 2015 paper showing higher diversity within Africa. Each data point, each little plus sign on this figure represents a single individual. And on the y-axis, we have the variants, uh, variant sites per genome in millions. So out of 3 billion sites, or 6 billion in a diploid genome, how many million variants are there? Well, what we find is that African populations tend to have more variants than anywhere else in the world. Prediction confirmed. We also predicted that non-African populations would nest within the clade of African populations, and that's exactly what we see. So in this figure, the red lines indicate African lineages, and all the other colors indicate non-African, and you can see that the common ancestor back here is red, indicating that is an African population from which all others are descended. And all of the diversity in all of those other populations, all the other humans around the world, it represents a subset of the diversity within African populations. In other words, it nests within the African clade. Prediction confirmed. And one more, and this is one of my favorite data sets in the world, I think this is so cool, we see less diversity as we move further and further away from East Central Africa, which is where we think humanity originated. This figure on the y-axis shows haplotype heterozygosity, which is a measure of genetic diversity. And on the x-axis, this is so cool, shows distance to AA. AA means Addis Ababa, which is the capital of Ethiopia, which is in East Central Africa. And then you can see these data points here are color-coded according to the region. So we've got Africa, Europe, uh, Middle East, kind of in maroon there, uh, Central and South Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. The lower the data points are, the less diversity there is. And as you can see, the closer you are to East Central Africa, the more diversity you have in that population. Exactly what we would predict based on the out of Africa hypothesis of human origins. Predictions confirmed.
But we're not done with human evolution yet because we can look even more specifically and look at human founder events as humans migrated and use that as a check against the calculated human mitochondrial substitution rate. We can say, is our substitution rate correct? Well, let's check it against migration events and find out. So the hypothesis here is that you need to have time dependence in your mitochondrial substitution rate. And I talked about this previously. I'll link the video down below if you want to get a little bit more into time dependence. But the idea is the uh, observed mutation rate will change as you go back in time. It'll slow down due to things like inbreeding and selection and genetic drift. And you have to account for this when you're doing uh, long-term calculations, like calculating the time to the most recent common ancestor for part of the genome. So this figure is from a 2009 paper showing this time dependence in mutation rate right here. So the prediction is that we can use the calculated time dependent rate and that should yield coalescent dates in line with recorded history and archeological data for specific migration events. In other words, we know when specific migration events happens like island colonizations, for example. And we should be able to compare the genomes of the island populations and the sister groups, whether it's other islands or mainland populations or whatever. We should be able to compare them and calculate a time to most recent common ancestor. Using our calculated mitochondrial substitution rate here, we predict that the dates we're going to arrive at will be in line with the historical or archaeological dates for those events. So once again, in this case, we have some confirmed predictions. Now, this figure is not in the paper, but the data are in the paper, but I made this figure to show them in a clear way. In blue, we have the predicted times for the various uh, migration events in thousands of years ago. So that's KYA across the x-axis here from zero to 50,000 years ago. And then the lines represent the 95% confidence intervals. The red boxes indicate the observed dates based on archaeological or historical evidence. And we have four specific instances that we are testing against. We have the settlement of Europe, which is agreed to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 45,000 years ago. We have the settlement of Japan about 32,000 years ago. And then we have two islands. We have Vanuatu, which was only about 3,000 and change years ago, and the Canary Islands, which were just a little over 2,000 years ago. And in each case, you can see that the predicted date of that migration and settlement is uh, overlapping with the actual uh, time. These ranges are extremely small, and you can't even like see the diamond for Vanuatu because all the numbers just sit right on top of each other, basically hit exactly where that expected date would be. So we're using our genetic data to make predictions uh, about when certain things were founded or settled, and then we are testing those dates against the archaeological and historical data, and we find those two things are in line. Predictions concerning the human mitochondrial substitution rate confirmed. By the way, I want to say one thing about this, and it's that creationists sometimes claim that stuff like I just described doesn't actually count because, well, it's, it's I've variously heard the phrase post-diction or retro-diction. Basically, oh, you're not predicting about things that'll happen in the future. You're predicting things that happened in the past, so it's not really a prediction. Well, you know what? Any creationist who says that can take a walk because this is exactly what Nathaniel Jensen does in his papers on mitochondrial uh, mutation rates. So for example, here's a figure from his 2015 paper, uh, confirmation of the human mitochondrial DNA clock, predictions of whole genome mitochondrial DNA diversity in humans were made for the young earth creation and evolution slash old earth timescales using the mutation rate derived in table one. These predictions were compared, blah, 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 blah. This is exactly the same thing. Creationists try to have it both ways here, but it's very clear that what biologists do is hypothesis testing and making and testing specific predictions. Last case I will tell you about today is perhaps my favorite, and it is the case of the naked mole rat. Now, before we talk about specifically what's going on here, I have to tell you about eusociality, which is a social system in which there is a division of labor within the population between reproducing and non-reproducing individuals. And typically, the non-reproducing individuals are going to cooperatively care for the young. They're going to contribute even though they are not actually reproducing. And we typically see this limited to insects, so things like bees and ants, like a, like a bee colony, right? That's your, your quintessential eusocial uh, animal group.
in the kind of mid to late 20th century, I think it was kind of in the mid 60s, he started proposing this kind of thing. Um, an evolutionary biologist named Richard Alexander uh, proposed the hypothesis that a eusocial vertebrate could exist. And based on what he knew about insects and evolution, he actually built a 12 part model uh, describing what this hypothetical organism would look like. There were 12 specific predictions. I'm not going to go through them all, but I'll give you just a few. So for example, he said this would most likely be a rodent. It would live underground. Its primary food source would be uh, tubers and other root sources of food. Uh, he said it would live in the tropics in a hard clay soil and it would most likely live somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. So these are extremely specific predictions about what might hypothetically exist. Now, he uh, kind of went on a speaking tour in 1975 and 76, uh, presenting this, this hypothesis and this model of a eusocial vertebrate at various conferences. And at one particular one, I believe in Flagstaff, Arizona, I forget the year, 75 or 76, somebody brought up to him and said, hey, you know, you're describing, bit by bit, you're describing an organism called the naked mole rat. That's interesting. So the naked mole rat fit his model to a T. You can go item by item, sub-Saharan Africa, clay soil, ba 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 all down the list, and you're describing the naked mole rat. Now, at the time, in the 1970s, the social structure of the naked mole rat was unknown. But this hypothesis led people to look into the social structure of the naked mole rat. And by the late 80s and into the early 90s, there were a bunch of publications and a bunch of studies that showed that the naked mole rat was in fact an example of a eusocial vertebrate. And it hit every note that Alexander had originally predicted. So this is a really beautiful confirmation of a set of predictions that led to the discovery of something that had never been seen before, a eusocial mammal. So to summarize everything we talked about today, creationists claim evolutionary theory and evolutionary biologists do not make testable predictions. I've provided a small number of the many examples of testable predictions made by evolutionary biologists that have been confirmed. So today we talked about Tiktaalik, we talked about a bunch of aspects of human evolution, and we talked about the super cool example of the naked mole rat, a eusocial mammal. So, are there no testable predictions from evolutionary theory and evolutionary biologists? No. That is a creation myth. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Don't get fooled.